welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your evenings to join us tonight. Uh, my name is Chris Ventura and I am the co-founder of Harness Projects. Uh, we deliver project-based learning courses in UX design, product management and digital marketing. And in tonight's webinar, we will be lifting the hood on what hiring managers look for during UX design job interviews. So if any of you have been rejected from a role that you've interviewed for, you know that a lot of the time there is little explanation of what went wrong. Uh, so in this webinar, we are going to be demonstrating the job interview process. We'll be conducting 15 minute segments across four major interview themes. Uh, these are typical question themes that you might expect in any UX job interview. And they are career history and experience will be the first one. Then we'll go into UX methodology. The third will be project experience. And the final one will be situational and behavioral fit. So to help us understand what works and what doesn't, I'm joined by our esteemed panel of UX hiring managers. Uh, so I wanna welcome uh, them now. Elizabeth Peck is the head of UX at News Corp. Uh, welcome, Liz. Thank you. Also, Nima Idel is the former head of UX at IAG. So he'll join us uh, for the second part of this session. Hey, Nima. How you doing? And finally, Andy Hiles, who's the Senior UX Manager at Vodafone. Welcome, Andy. Hi, everyone. So between all of them, they have interviewed probably hundreds, if not thousands, of UX job candidates over their careers. Uh, and what we'll be doing is they'll be providing feedback to three of our courageous graduates who will be participating tonight. So I also want to welcome them. Uh, we're welcoming Ma uh, Carla Muller, Levi Tran and Mahin Reza, who have all recently completed a UX design course uh, with us here at Harness Projects. So welcome all of you guys. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, I think it goes without saying uh, for everyone in attendance that doing an interview on its own is daunting enough, but to do it in front of a live audience is um, quite a courageous task. So I really just want to take my hat off to these three graduates for putting their hands up and being willing to do this in front of everyone for all of our benefit. So um, please embrace them in that in the spirit of learning and the spirit of understanding that this is not an easy task, um, but they're doing it for, for all of our benefits. So uh, thank you guys and um, yeah, really appreciate it. Now, a few other little bits and pieces. Um, given this is a mock job interview, so um, what we've done is we've created a generic job ad uh, to give the graduates and the hiring managers just some context on the role that they're applying for. So I'm gonna paste this in the chat now for you all, just so that you have something to refer to if some keywords come up. Um, the company we've come up with a very creative name of Acme. <laughs> so that's going to be, if you hear that, you know what it's all about. So I'll post that in the uh, chat in a, in a moment. There you go. Um, so yeah, feel free to check that out. It's a very generic job ad, one that you would typically expect from a UX design role in a, in a junior capacity. So we are talking about junior um, sort of level of experience here. Okay, so on to the first segment. Um, if people do have questions um, just before we jump in, uh, feel free to use the Q&A button. We don't necessarily have a Q&A piece um, in this, uh, in this uh, particular webinar like we've done in the past for those of you who've been here before. Um, we will have a lot of feedback that the mentors will be giving each of the graduates after each segment. So we're hoping that that answers a lot of your questions, but still feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them as I, as I can while the interview process is underway. Okay. So first up, we will, um, so that's our lovely panel. And we have, first up is Carla. Um, I'm gonna field the first question just to get the ball rolling. And then at the end of this segment, we will hand over to the panel for feedback on Carla's interview approach. This is uh, basically a, generally something that happens at the beginning of an interview where we're trying to get an understanding of why this person has applied for a role. So my question to Carla as the hiring manager would be, um, tell me about your career history and why is your experience relevant for this role that you've applied for? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, I started off in 
uh, as a web designer and I got picked up quite early on in the piece. I studied communication design at university and I quickly got snapped up with a web agency building intranets and moved on to um, user interface design in terms of um, websites and worked with the Department of Housing and built um, some websites with the Queensland Art Gallery, um, which was a really great experience for some front end work. Um, I then quickly moved on as a team leader within an agency and, and led a group of uh, web designers and, and then jumped on further again to be a national website manager for a mid-tier accounting firm. So that was quite good experience in the fact that that was the start of moving into more what you didn't call it back user experience back then, but more customer experience. So I had a lot of direct contact with a lot of heads of department. I rolled out the international web standards and bought analytics to continually improve that web presence for that mid-tier accounting firm. And a major part of that role too was to develop engaging content. So working with each of the heads of department to ensure their content was relevant, timely and continually up to date in terms of um, the content matter, which was accounting, obviously. Um, from there, I actually went on to freelance and as a freelancer, I had a major part in, um, you know, specking projects for web design people come to me organically because they knew I was a web designer. And then from that, um, clients wanted flyers, they wanted logos. So I moved into a lot of graphic design work as well, which was really good in terms of honing my skills for layout, color, typography, and that sort of thing. Because I moved a lot onto graphic design side of things, um, I ended up in marketing and design not long ago. Um, and this is where I become frustrated actually with marketing because it was all about demographics and a lot less about funnily enough the consumer or the, the user at the end of the day. Um, I, was a I was working alongside a UX person at the time and um, she suggested I look at user experience and last year I was super fortunate enough to find Harness Projects and worked on three really great um, user experience projects with IKEA, Centre of Hope and um, The Daily Addict. And because I learned all these great skills um, with UX with them, I actually employed that in my job at the time as a, as a graphic designer and web admin person at Ascent Footwear last year. So they were wanting to improve their e-com sales and their online user experience. So I set up with a hypothesis, um, questionnaires, surveys, set up Hotjar on their website and basically we gathered a whole heap of data and I reported back to them and um, funnily enough some of the stakeholders, the owners didn't like what I had to say um, but um, fortunately enough we ended up making changes to the navigation, to um, the home page and found out that there was a fair bit of technical information about the shoes which wasn't even getting looked at so because of the extraordinary projects I work with with Harness um, I was able to roll that out to in a quick short amount of time um, with my current job. Now I'm doing a lot of web builds I've since moved on to a agency so I'm doing a lot of WordPress web builds and with that, um, you know, I'm working with layouts, navigation, um, content management. Um, and because it's agency, there's no time for user-centred design and methodologies. So um, that's why I'm, I'm here looking for a UX job. So that brings me to today. Awesome. Thanks for the, for the background and context, Carla. Really, help, really helpful to... to draw that picture in my mind of, you know, your history and, and why you're looking at a UX role. Now, I just want to say to the attendees, Carla did a great job there. I mean, that was super articulate, very clear, engaging. Um, she took me on that journey, on that story. Um, I actually was thinking I had a few follow-on questions that were coming to me. 
um, around certain areas, um, particularly some situational behavioral questions that could have come up when she mentioned that uh, she started getting frustrated with marketing and, and some of the consumer focus, but the lack of user experience focus. Um, I'm not gonna go there now because we're gonna come back to situational and behavioral in another segment, but that's where you just wanna share that because that's where threads start to move into different parts of the interview. So you're not always gonna have a linear process in your interview where it's career history, job UX methodology, et cetera. You're gonna get, you're gonna be moved around a lot. So you have to be able to flow with that as much as possible. Um, but I think you did a really good job, Carly. And you also, I. I know you did well in that part because there was a moment where I was going to ask a follow on question and you began answering it without me asking. And it was about why UX. So great history, but why the change? And you started answering that without me asking. When you can nail that, you're, you're, you're establishing really strong rapport with your hiring manager. You're also establishing a confidence um, that you're clear on why you're here. And that's also um, reassuring for myself. So with that said, I'll pass on to the other panelists for, for further feedback. Hey guys, I can jump in here. Um, so Carla, I thought you came across really well, really um, warm. And I think like echo what Chris said, there was a lot of points there that I was kind of ready to jump in and, and dig into the different topics. So you really kind of provided quite a lot of um, information and interesting snippets of, um, you know, what you've done in your career. Um, I really like the way you brought it back to the user as well. There was a couple of times where you came back around to the user and you could see just from the answer that it was really kind of front and center of your thinking and, and the direction that you want to go in. Um, and I think just through the, you know, the breadth of um, work that you discussed and things that you've done, it really just helped me build a picture of, you know, your, your I guess your UX toolbox and not just that, but other things like stakeholder management, you know, presentations, um, you know, obviously, you know, done a lot of, um, had a lot of variety in your roles and, and lots of relevant digital experience, especially with the, the graphic design, which, as you said, a lot of the principles, um, you know, do flow into UI design and web design too. So, yeah, it was a it was a really good start, and it was um, it left me, you know, wanting to ask a lot more questions, which is obviously a great thing. Okay, I'll hand over now, guys. I'll jump in if that's all right. Um, uh, great um, explanation and storytelling, Carla. That was um, like <clears throat> we can picture your entire experience, which is great, um, and echoing the um, previous feedback. But one of the thing, one of the stuff that I <clears throat> thought was interesting was um, th there's one part that yeah, I, I would say you'd want to be aware and uh, and be cautious of as a designer is um, potentially saying that um, stakeholders didn't like what you had to say, and it's not you. It's the customer, it's the user. So you want to detach yourself from the data and from what you find because you're not the instigator, you're not the person that is giving that data, you're, you're uncovering it. Um, and just make sure that um, you articulate it that way. Otherwise you're going to be seen as a, as a, as a thorn um, and, and someone who's going to cause a lot of um, strife in a company that might not be ready for the kind of stuff that you give. So one of the things to be very wary of is that the person who's hiring you is hiring some, um, hiring is looking to hire someone for confidence and a little bit of clarity. What you don't want is an opinion. You can give your recommendation, but try not to um, potentially come off that way that it's an opinion versus another opinion. And therefore um, you lost that battle. It's the fact that the stakeholders weren't um, prioritizing the feedback that came back from the users. It wasn't, you know, a business um, priority. So that's the only thing I'd say is that you, if you refine that, you're removing yourself from being in a in, in bit of the spotlight. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think, um, you know, what um, hiring managers are looking for is not the cookie cutter UX designer. Um, we're looking for outside experience that we could leverage to be able to t take that role and, and, and get more value. Um, and the further you are from that, um, from a, a typical UX, the better, because you're looking for difference of opinion, difference of approach, looking at, uh, looking at different ways of looking at gender equality, ethnicity, like biases. Um, and so, um, you telling that story really removed me from going, you're just a cookie cutter. So it was a great way of explaining your story. And I think you did a, a really great job. Um, and my last small piece of feedback is 
don't overestimate the changes you can do from best practice in your existing role to prove the value of design. Because hiring a junior, you don't always get the power to be able to show off and you'll get to do a little bit of small things here and there and get mentored. But um, Catherine Courage, who's now the vice president of um, design and, and um, product at um, Google, she started off at Citrix doing the smallest wins and trying to prove herself and it took her seven years, but now look at where she is. And she changed the way people understand UX from a product perspective. So like um, if you do find small wins, even in your current role, try to do them because it's a great portfolio piece anyway. Look at the statistics and show the value that you were able to bring to in that business um, with that project. That's my two cents. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dima. Over to you, Liz. Oh, hi, Carla. Um, it's been a while since um, I have Centre for Hope Project, so lovely to see you. And um, I'm glad that you brought that into your storytelling as well. So I, I just... I don't have a lot to add in terms of what the feedback that's been given already. Um, I, I thought you did that really well. Um, you really were quite direct in terms of answering the question, like you didn't waffle um, and you really told your story really well. Like I could, I could understand your whole entire career experience, but you told it in a really engaging way. Um, and so congratulations, because it might seem like you did it really effortlessly, but um, I know a lot of people, a lot of candidates that really just struggled with that story. And it, and it can be a bit boring, almost like the, the, the way they would just repeat what's already in their resume, but you really added a lot of, um, you know, the, sort of, I guess, your motivation and a lot of colour into, into the story, which really drew me in. So thank you. Thanks, Liz. Awesome. Thanks, Carla. We will move on to the next section now, which is with Levy on UX methodology. Over to Nima for the question and then take it away. Hi, Levy. How are you? Hi, Nima. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Good, good. Um, so, you know, part of the process that um, you're going to experience is that a lot of times they're going, there's going to be some generic questions um, that are going to be asked of you. And generally, those generic questions are trying to understand where, whether, how much detail you know and, you know, how much of it do you, um, of, of, of the core beliefs of um, your, uh, your industry do you understand? So one of the main questions you're going to get in front of you a lot of times is what is, what is UX design? Um, and, and that's one of the questions that I want to um, put in front of you first is how do you explain it? Sure. So um, I can explain it in two ways. Maybe I will attempt the first way that I explained to my parents when I told them I wanted to do a course with Harness Projects first because <laughs> that's the uh, simple and layman way of explaining it. Um, so... The way I explain to them is that with UX, we try to design products and services so that it's so easy and intuitive to understand and to use and solve the problems for the users the best we can. So um, I made an analogy to a banana, for example. So a banana would have a peel that is yellow when it's ripe and good to eat. So it signals to the user very intuitively you know, when it's good to eat. The peel also protects the banana from uh, the environment and it also protects the user's hands from being dirty when they're eating it. So it's a perfect case, very easy to understand how to use a banana. So um, taking that analogy and putting it into uh, products and services such as websites, um, uh, apps, or even physical products, the job of the UX designer is to do the same thing, to let users intuitively understand how to use a product, to use it with a pleasant um, experience, to return to using it, and uh, to basically, uh, and most importantly, is to solve what it is that they need the product to solve for them. Um, and that is how I would explain uh, my understanding of UX design. Great. We'll come to. I've got two or three questions, so we'll we'll go. We'll continue rolling with it, and then at the end, we'll have the judges and um give give feedback on um some some uh on your on your answers. Um. So the other part is okay. Great. So you've explained um UX design. I guess you've explained that it's to help products and experiences to be intuitive. What is the process? How do you go about doing that? 
Um, so the process starts with understanding the users. And um, in order to do that, we would um, do user research. And this can be uh, accomplished in many ways. Um, but um, one of the most common ways that we would do that is to um, interview users or do focus groups and try to put ourselves in their shoes to understand what it is that uh, is um, giving them pain points in using the products and services. Um, there are, and then after that, um, we try to synthesize these understanding and findings into concrete UX, UX deliverables such as personas and user um, journeys or jobs to be done so that the findings is easy to understand, easy to communicate between different um, um, teams and even to the stakeholders uh, such as business owners. Um, and then we go into the second part of the uh, double diamond process of design, which is to then open ourselves up to uh, ideas, to generate as many ideas as possible, um, to do brainstorming, and then um, doing prototypes and wireframes and uh, mock-ups of these uh, ideas so that we can then bring these ideas to the users and then test the, um, whether that these designs will uh, achieve what we want them to do. Um, is it understandable for the users? Is it good? Uh, is it um, easy for the users to to use? Um, and then after that, uh, we reiterate uh, on these designs based on the feedback from the users testing and then uh, hand off to developers. So this is a basic process that I usually use for my um, UX projects, but it is not a linear pro uh, process. So we would go back to different steps uh, as and when needed. Great. So you've talked about um, the whole discovery side and talking to customers and stuff. So can you tell me the difference between a, a user interview and let's say um, user testing? Sure. So um, user interview is often um, conducted at the beginning of the project where we are not limiting users to specific tasks, um, but really leaving the door open to all possibilities. Um, so that we don't miss out on any um, unforeseen um, user scenarios that we didn't expect. Um, and so these interviews are uh, often open-ended, um, conducted with users one-on-one. -on -one. It can be while the users is um, using it in the wild even. So, um, it can be, for example, contextual inquiry where um, we're, we're seeing someone who is, uh, for example, using a tax software for days and days, or it can be quite structured where we will ask users um, how they would go about um, using a software for, for tax purposes. Um, in contrast, where user testing, it is more at the um, conducted at the later stage of the uh, UX project where we already have um, some sort of prototype or wireframe so that we can ask users to do specific tasks and evaluate their answers on whether the design choices um, help them with their experience. Great. I'm gonna stop those questions so we don't have to run out of time and we can have some um, time for feedback. So uh, judges, what, um, Panel, or well, um, any any feedback? Who would like to go? Um, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll go. Um, I thought you really answered that very well. Um, particularly, I like the analogy that you described around um, explaining UX design to your parents and using the example of the banana. I had not heard that before. I, I might try um, to reuse that at some stage when I have to try and explain it to my 90 year old parents <laughs> as well, because to this day, they don't know what I do. So that that's really, really great. Um, I think um, you were obviously very well prepared 
for that. Um, you would uh, be surprised to, to know how many people that I've interviewed and they absolutely just you know, stuck with that first question and they're stumbling and it's really great that you've pre 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 prepared for it and have something to talk about. Um, I think, um, well, particularly the, the, the piece that I, I picked up on um, when you were describing the difference between user interviews and user testing, um, for me, it's also really important that you talk about from a, the user interview piece, it's, it's about, under, you know, discovering um, user needs and discovering their pain points um, rather than uh, sort of almost describing just what the technique was, which is what you described really well, um, that, you know, it was open ended and, and not limited and um, kind of, you know, understanding how they use things, but sort of try to explain what was the, what is the purpose like what, what at the end of the day why do you do those user interviews um but yeah i i thought you you answered that really really well that that was my my take on it thanks liz andy awesome so i thought you articulated really well um i echo what liz said and that you came across uh, very confident and you know you give really comprehensive answers and it sometimes is quite difficult to be caught, quite easy to be caught off guard by those kinds of questions, you know, we have to define something because although obviously, you know, it's, it's what we do sometimes when you have to explain it, um, you know, formally, it's going to be quite difficult. So I think you did really well there. Um, again, like the banana analogy, analogy, I thought that was a really interesting way to do it. Um, one thing it might have been that I noted down is that um, it's always nice to kind of talk to data as well. Uh, it's not it's not always just interviews, but gathering data, or you might have um, some analytics that point you in the direction of a problem. So maybe just something to cover in that area. Um, in terms of yeah, defining user testing and user interviews, I thought your answer was really good. Uh, it was really spot on there, um, and I like the way you kind of. You know, you spoke to the user usability testing towards, you know, furthering the project when you're already, um, you know, you already got something to test and you've already got an understanding of what you're trying to solve. So um, overall, I thought it was really good, um, really nicely articulated. Uh, so well done. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, any other final bits, Nima, or are you, are you happy with that? I was just going to um, add on to Liz's um, comment. I think um, with with our work, it's uh, a lot of times it, my parents don't even know what I do. My brother and sister still don't get it. So like it's it's normal and natural. And I think um, when you explain what you do, or, um, it, it's very hard for them to understand. But if you give them context of why you're doing it, um, you'll always get the most out of um, or they'll get the most out of what your what the intent of design and user experience is. Um, and the analogy, I think, with, um, you know, re research and usability, if you go back to the banana, you could say that research in general could be that data's come in that people are not digesting bananas properly. And then you start looking at it and going, well, I've got to go into it further. So you do some um, observational and in contextual inquiry, observational analysis, you go in and ask them, why are you eating a banana? What, what's with the banana? Why is it not okay? And then you can go into usability and assess if the banana is being like digested properly, peeled properly. And surprisingly enough, most people peel bananas wrong. It, everyone says it's a great, it's a great tool. It's actually not. The way we skin bananas is wrong. Uh, and that's a great example of where um, usability, um, contextual inquiry, user interviews can be, um, can be different. They all have their purposes. And that's why we have such a, a wide net to be able to catch um, problems and try and fix um, any friction that um, a, a product or a service may cause. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. That was uh, that was great. Well done, Levy. We'll uh, we'll come back to you for another section uh, later on. I'm uh, going to now. Thank you, everyone, for the feedback. Cheers. No problem. So this is a, a dual section. So we're going to go a little bit longer um, over this. We're going to give both Levy and Mahin a chance to present um, or to answer questions around their project experience. So typically in a UX job interview, uh, hiring managers are going to want to know or take, have you take you, them through a, a full project experience that you've been on and what you learned from and all different aspects. So um, Andy's going to field these questions. Uh, Mahin, do you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Andy. How are you? Over to you. Hey, how are you doing? Okay. So, yeah, as Chris said, this is always a, this is always a question that will come up in a, in a UX interview. And I guess it's one that often you'll spend a bit of time on. Um, so essentially what I'd like you to do is pick a piece from your portfolio uh, yeah. and just talk us through it. So, you know, 
uh, tell us about the, the project, tell us what your role was and what your responsibilities were, um, you know, what was, the, what was the problem you were trying to solve. Um, and if you can just kind of take us on the journey of, of that project. I'm going to start um, a bit about my background. Um, I'm Mahin Reza. I have completed a UX certificate course with Harness Project recently, where I collaborated on different UX projects with high profile companies like IKEA, the Swag, and Communiteer. Uh, before that, I worked uh, with customers and for customers' benefit uh, in my previous uh, position in origin as an outbound sales consultant and in course as a customer ex, um, representative. Uh, so today I will walk you through the community or mobile website UX design project, which is uh, intended for uh, volunteers who are looking for virtual volunteering. Uh, in this project, I performed um, UX research, created a wireframe and prototype, and conducted usability tests with target custom, uh, customers. So these are the topics I uh, will discuss today. Uh, so uh, Community is a web-based virtual volunteering platform which connects skill-based uh, volunteers to seek um, volunteering opportunities and uh, charities for social good. Uh, community mobile website uh, supplement the existing um, desktop site to increase engagement with those who seek online volunteer opportunity on the go. Um, community site helps volunteer to browse um, and join project events, to join volunteering communities, to communicate activities. So my approach towards uh, solving the problem was performing research to identify company objectives and user needs. Um, defining and identifying uh, identi uh, uh, necessary features and creating wireframe and prototype for presenting the design and conducting usability tests with target customers for validation. Uh, for research, I started with uh, stakeholders interviews to understand company objectives and needs for the mobile site. Uh, then I performed user research with the target user to understand their needs and pain point while using on um, an online volunteer, volunteering platform. And then I analyzed and synthesized research data using affinity map, empathy map, and persona. So this is the journey map showing the process Tamara's um, needs, uh, needs to go through on the community's mobile website to become a volunteer. So these steps are showing her activities on the site and her feelings at different stage of, of her experience with the site. Uh, for example, she feels frustrated when she is asked to sign up before deciding on the project she wants to join. Also, she feels happy when uh, she finds uh, the project, a uh, desired project. Uh, this is the, uh, from the research data and journey map, I created some uh, user story to refine features and then uh, created maps to organize content and maintain information hierarchy. And of all of the research and com content organization, I started drawing different designs of the application on paper and I created the digital version of the best design and made the prototype uh, use, using the sketch tool. So these are some screens from the final project, which is showing uh, user interaction between different inter um, interfaces at different stages. Um, so here, here you can see a volunteer uh, can browse project or event, a uh, browse project or learn about different projects or events. They can also choose project using filters. Once they choose a project, they can apply uh, to volunteer by signing up. So. <laughs> I just, um, So upon uh, usability tests, 90% uh, of uh, user found user founds that a new design um, of community or mobile website 
mobile site was very easy to navigate and to find the suitable volunteering opportunity. Also, user can view all uh, project details, um, pause events um, before uh, signing in the volunteering platform, uh, which they thought was very helpful and um, easy to helpful to make decision. Um, so this is screen uh, is um, here is showing uh, the final outcome of uh, sorry just outcome of the prototype um, a refined prototype of community mobile website which helps with browse and join project events to join volunteering communities uh, to communication activities between vol uh, volunteers and admin uh, admins. So this project and the design help the client uh, to learn about the user needs and pain point of using the mobile site. Also, it helps them to improve uh, improve design to increase user engagement um, because uh, there are 30 to 50% user actually operating community website through mobile. Yeah, so yeah, uh, that's the wrap of my presentation. Thank you all, any question? Awesome, thank you very much for that. So I'll put it out to the, to the panel again um, for feedback and then I'll come in uh, afterwards. I'll, I'll jump in this time first. So me and Liz are tag TV. Um, great presentation, Mahin. Um, uh, it was great to see how you've um, highlighted the processes and the structure that you've, um, you went through. Um, some, some feedback I'd say, some of the things that stood out um, that you, you'd want to probably explain a little further is that, um, you know, when you're creating those personas, um, how, did you, how did you come up with that, that, that the frustrations and, 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 you know, lights and delights and uh, moments of pain? Is that an assumption? Did you, did you ever validate it? Was it just you going in and using it and then empathizing and creating those personas? Or was that after you had spoken to eight, 10, 12 users and so forth. So that would, that would help clarify that it's not a, um, a waterfall kind of approach. And we want to make sure that we're always careful that we're not um, forcing our own opinions on solutions and, and, and that situation. So I'm sure you did, the, uh, you did a great job. Just clarifying those little bits um, would help to um, take us along that journey. Um, and the other one was like, um, you, were, you did some amazing um, uh, my friend or hand sketches um, and you went for the best design what made that best design how did you choose what that designs kind of um which one came out first why well, you know what were the triggers to make that number one so that would be useful as well those those little bits um take us along that journey to understanding how you're making those decisions is it um subjective is it objective and those are quite important for us to know that you know uh, as ux designers we're hoping that everyone comes in with a very objective uh, approach you empathize but you never try to force your own um views on things and that you're trying to look at um, what our customers want and what best practice is, but never something that we want to do ourselves. Um, and, and lastly, when you gave feedback, 90% um, of users um, recorded it and it was great. How many people, even if it's six, even if it's four, that's fine, but give us that N so that we know what the, what those factors were and what, you know, what the parameters were of that testing piece. But um, you did a fantastic job articulating your approach um, and your, and your designs look great. So great job. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll um, add to, to Nima's um, and, and, you know, my feedback's very much um, echoing um, what Nima's um, mentioned as well. I think um, congratulations for putting together this presentation because um, I, I think a lot of uh, candidates who are, you know, putting themselves out there in the market sometimes feel like, oh, I have to have my portfolio in as a website or, you know, something really amazing and fancy. Um, but I think just even structuring it into Google Slides in, the, in, a, in a very quite a kind of structured way as, as you've done here, um, that really reflects you and your style and, um, and, and the project as well, really can just help you as a presenter to come across more confidently and to tell your story more confidently. 
Um, and the reason why I'm giving this feedback is I've noticed uh, in the Q&A, there were some questions around, you know, what's the, what's the right format for your portfolio? Should that be a website or should that be a PowerPoint or should that be a PDF? It really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it needs to help you as a presenter to tell your story, to, to, to kind of um, really engage with your, the person that you're trying to, to speak to. So um, well done for, for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So yeah, I can jump in now. So look, very similar feedback. I thought it was a really great way to display your to display your project in the in the deck that you've created. I kind of thought it was cool the way you've got the you know the GIF as well that showed just a bit more than a static static image, helped bring it to life a bit. Um, and I really liked the way you've structured it. So you know, even looking at this, I can see what you're going to talk about. It's easy to follow as you're going through. Um, you also, I noticed you also packaged up exactly what you did on the project at the very start. So it was well, um, well articulated there. In terms of um, the detail that you gave on the different sections, I would, there was some really, um, there were some areas that you could have really dived deeper into. And for example, when I saw your uh, customer journey map, I thought that was awesome. But I'd have really loved to have learned how you created that, you know, who you spoke to, what were the um, insights that you took from that. Um, so I guess, you know, in a in a in a one-on-one -on -one interview, maybe we would have dug into those things more. So those are the things you could expect questions on. I guess it's slightly different in a format when you're in a on a panel. Um, and then yeah, I, I think it would have just been nice to have gone a little bit deeper into each section and just give us a give us a bit more of a flavor of, I guess we got a really good um, view of the what, but it's more the how and the why and you know what informed those decisions and what were those stats. Um, and also, I think I think we mentioned it before, but um, talking about you know any challenges you came across, like how did the solution evolve as you uh, as you were testing it, as you got to more know, know more about the customer and the insights that you had, uh, because one thing you're always looking for um, as a hiring manager as well is the ability to adapt and be pragmatic. You know, some things some things really surprise you, and you have to change tact, and you know sometimes you're up against a timeline. So it's good to to understand and, and know that um, you know the candidates can. Um, can work outside of the comfort zone almost and, and are able to, you know, think on the feet and, and switch directions when it, when needs be. And even if it goes against your kind of UX belief, if the numbers or the data that you're getting is telling you to go in another direction, not being afraid to do that and being, being able to, to execute that. But overall, I thought it was really good. Um, love the structure. I love how, um, how you flood the information through. And yeah, just, I guess, a, a, a little bit more detail in the sections, which if it was in a one-on-one -on -one interview, I would have, I would have, you know, probed further. So well done, great. Thank you, Andrew, thank you. Great, thanks guys. I just wanna add a couple bits at the end of this as well, because there has been a few Q and A questions around the same theme, which is, do you bring in a website portfolio? Do you bring in slides? Um, what is the expectation? Now it's different depending on, um, what you've been asked to do beforehand that you may be prompted to come in to present and you specifically know you're going in to present a portfolio piece. That's not always the case though. And so you need to be able to speak to your portfolio piece without the scaffolding and safety of slides, just in case. You need to be able to do both and be able to adapt to that situation. Um, however, if you do bring in slides, the slides need to elevate the explanation and, it ha and as Mahim was showing have those visual treats that really help to drive and drive that focus and engagement try and avoid to read off the slides you absolutely need to avoid reading off the slides because it comes across as a scaffolding of safety it, it's something that's making it easier because you're nervous and you want to just get through and and say the exact right thing the problem is is that come that comes across that perhaps without the slides the level of confidence in the source material isn't as strong. And I don't know if it is or not, but that's an assumption I might make as a hiring manager. So you just need to be careful of slides hindering you rather than elevating you. Um, but if with good visuals and with one of the tricks with slides is not to put too many too much text on them. So you're forced to have to speak off your own gut knowledge, your own instinct. Um, and that will only come from an experience that you've had. So if you've had project experience, it will naturally rise to the surface because it's a tangible thing that you've done in the past. And so I just wanna share that because there is no right or wrong answer about bringing slides or a website or just talking off the cuff. It really depends, um, but just be aware of those 
those gotchas that can happen um, where you might fall into the trap of reading off the slides. So, um, but I think you did a really great job anyway, Mahin. It was um, really well structured and helped to just tell the story from start to finish. Um, and I think the major bit of feedback there what Andy and others mentioned is where possible, look for those opportunities to highlight the actual detailed nuanced work that you did to learn something about the user to um, make a decision on why you took a certain design choice or why you took a certain um, does, uh, journey mapping approach that sort of stuff will help to show your depth um, in the critical thinking space of ux design so awesome thank you chris thank you no worries. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I've got it. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you, Andy. Uh, and the project that I'd like to talk about is Mind a Bump. And it is one of the projects that I did recently with Hannah's projects. Um, the situation for this project that came about is that it is a mobile app that teaches meditation and mindfulness for expectant Australian mums. And it comes from this um, nonprofit called Smiling Mind. And they actually are uh, the market leader in terms of meditation apps in Australia. However, Mind the Bump is one of their older products in the portfolio and with a uh, much nicher focus on just uh, pregnant women or people who are trying to conceive or just, um, you know, recently delivered a baby. Now, um, the reason why um, Smiling Mind product designer uh, came to us in Hannes Projects uh, for help with UX is because it was, uh, the content of the, the, the app is really good because it's really backed by science. They have um, psychologists um, working tirelessly to create really good content, however, the users are quite frustrated by the UX, the really outdated UX. Um, for example, they really are not onboarded well to understand why they should be meditating and uh, being mindful of their mental health state uh, to begin with. And the app is not very successful at trying to help them build uh, habit, um, sorry, meditation into a daily habit. So, um, so the task is given to us is uh, to improve the app UX and the client specifically focused on um, wanting us to fix the timeline the navigation and the user retention of the app. And uh, I'll skip over the solution for a little bit. Um, I'll come back to that. But um, what I did during this project is uh, essentially to employ the full double diamond uh, design process, starting with emphasizing with the users, trying to understand what is their pain points. Um, so I interviewed six of my friends who are either pregnant or recently pregnant. And then uh, the insight that is gained from these interviews with them is that they all want to be physically and mentally healthy, but, uh, and they also, um, recognize that meditation can help um, to a degree. However, they all struggle to build a habit. Uh, it's very difficult for beginners to basically sit down and try to meditate even for five minutes. Um, so together with the rest of the team, uh, I move on with this, um, with this understanding of the users. I then defined um, the jobs to be done for the users. Um, user journey and also come up with personas of three different types of pregnant users, uh, sorry, um, three different types of users for the app and decided to focus on Emily, who is our uh, working pregnant mom to focus my ideation efforts on. And afterwards, um, I created um, brain writing uh, exercise to try to answer a couple of how might we questions that can um, bring about opportunities for design. So those would be how do we onboard Emily, this um, working, busy working pregnant mom to the mindfulness concept to convince her that yes, meditation helps her baby's development, helps her health and concretely why. Um, and also, um, 
from listening to uh, the uh, user interviews understand that for them, what is very important for this app to do, aside from you know having a generic daily meditation, is to help to have these SOS options to help them solve very pregnancy specific emotions, like when they are stressed because they get a bad um, scan result from the doctor. What can they do to calm down? And then lastly, uh, most importantly for them is that to help them build a very um, regular daily routine because they are quite busy. So um, with those ideations, I need to come up with opportunities. How These are the nine different opportunities of how to um, address those how my ways in the app. And then um, I tie that back to what the client was asking at the beginning you know, how does that affect the timeline, the navigation and the user retention of the app. Um, I went on to do some prototypes on paper, test it out with uh, these interviewees that I've interviewed before, and then did a high fidelity prototype. I'm sorry, the link is not available. Uh, but I'll show that in Sigma later. Um, and then also did a, a very short voice flow demo um, to illustrate one of the recommendation that the easiest way to uh, help integrate meditation into a user daily routine is to help them get access to it a lot faster. For example, a lot of these moms are cooking meals for themselves. And so um, they want to be able to say, hey, Google Assistant, um, you know, play me my next meditation. Um, so I summarized all these UX recommendations into 10 recommendations that they, uh, the organization can um, consider. And the top three were to personalize the meditation program recommended to each user by the trimester because they have different needs in each of the trimester um, to try to handhold these users through the first uh, step of using opening the app all the way till they reckon uh, they um, sign up and they try out the first few meditations because that's where a lot of the users drop out. Um, and lastly, to organize meditation by topics that is relevant to their um, daily routine. So for example, different topics for the mornings and different topics for the evenings. So the result of this project is uh, very positive. Um, we had a final presentation to the client and you can see here, this is the quote uh, verbatim from the client himself. He was really impressed with the recommendations I came up with and told me that I have hit the nail on the head on a lot of the findings um, and especially liked the recommendation about different topics of meditation by different times of day in order to fit into the user's daily routine. Um, and so maybe I can quickly roll back to the solution to um, show the, these are the final deliverables, some of the app screenshots, um, onboarding the users um, and searching for emotion, uh, emotion specific um, or using Google Assistant voice control to quickly get a meditation that is specifically targeted to the user's need. So that is um, my answer. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, did the panel have any feedback? And then I'll jump in afterwards. Um, yeah, I might just um, jump in, just gave my first impressions. Um, Libby, I thought you did that really well. Um, the fact that you have uh, you know, some, a website or a, um, something visual to share and present your case study. Um, it really, you know, puts you in a in a um, in, a, in a, a great position because there has been a number of uh, you know interviews that I've conducted where people do struggle with you know they know that they they need to kind of provide an example of or a case study or talk through a case study and they're not prepared at all um, and the fact that you've got one and and ready to go um, is is really put you in, in really great stead so um, well done for that um, it just in terms of the way you laid out um, that the structure of that of that case study the way you presented it I really like that you actually gave context um, about who smiling mine is or who what this mind the bump is all about because um, 
I've also interviewed a number of candidates where they kind of just assumed um, that you know <laughs> who the business is and quite, you know, some of them might be small businesses and uh, that we've not always heard of before. Um, and the, and also what you wrote, um, the, you, you explain who the company is and, and what the product is, but also like what, what was the goal that they were trying to achieve when they came to you to, to help um, solve your problem um, was really great. I, I, I really liked how you position that um, front and centre. Um, and then, uh, you know, the way you were describing uh, your process and, and kind of took me on a journey um, around sort of how you went about doing that um, was, was great too. Um, I would have liked to have heard a little bit more around maybe some of the challenges or some of the key learnings that you had um, from this, from doing this project, because um, it, it, it was a good articulation of, of the process and you know what you did the tasks that you did and uh, the fantastic outcome but um for me when i'm hiring someone i really it's really we, we know um when we're in our roles there will be there will come the time when we're coming across something you know a problem an issue a challenge and that's really important um to kind of hear up front around how you handle those those types of uh, situations so um yeah i think that that was that was my my first impression so well done Vivi, great, uh, great storytelling. Um, I'm just going to latch on the back of uh, Liz's feedback. I think um, your articulation was phenomenal. I think one thing you got to be might be a consideration is you told that story with context of the business brief, what the situation was, and then you went to the down to the bottom, the problem, then you went back up to the top the solution. Now, if you're giving your portfolio potentially to other UX managers, they will be reading it as context solution problem. And that's fine. But I think the way you spoke was far greater that that process was much better. So if, you, if my recommendation would be change that structure to give context of the brief, the problem and your solutions. And if you have anything, and this is the hardest thing to get, even in, in my position, is to try and show value or feedback or results. If you have any results, if you have things that the, the, the user said, like they loved it, it actually helped them, they, they felt like any, any kind of confirmation, not just that the client was happy, but that the users were happy would be very useful. Um, and, and lastly, wow, six friends that were pregnant or had kids, like, damn, that's, that's a lot of people around your network at that time. So that was a good brief, good timing. <laughs> awesome. awesome. So I, I can jump in here. So um, it was a, I love the way you articulated it. Really nice, clean uh, looking portfolio that you were able to, you know, scroll through and talk through. Uh, I do um, agree with, with, uh, with Nima around the, um, you know, the order in the way you kind of jumped to the bottom and came back up. I guess it's always, it's always nice to be taken on, a, on the journey. And, and, you know, so I guess all part of, this, of your story of how you went from the, the problem to the solution. Um, one thing that I, one thing that I noted down is I often am very interested in, in knowing exactly, I guess, the responsibilities of the, of the candidate in that particular project. Um, so, you know, was it, were, were you doing the research? I mean, in this, I'm guessing you did the whole thing. You did UI, you did research, you did interviews. So it's sometimes nice just to summarize, hey, at the start of this, I, you know, I was responsible for the research. I was responsible for the UI design. And I also, you know, I also conducted some usability testing and, and uh, presentation. So just, to, I guess, to package that up at the start to give the context. And then as you are running through the portfolio, I can understand, hey, so, you know, Levy's done all of this work and it's, you know, these are the, um, the tasks she's completed through it. Um, in terms of the um, usability testing and the interviews, I thought it was great. I would have loved to have known a little bit more just around the, you know, some of the questions you'd have or some of the setup and how you actually went about conducting those interviews and how you, you know, did the users use the app while they were doing it? Were you, were you more kind of focused on, was it more of a focus group style where you were just asking general questions around, hey, what do you expect or what do you need? Um, but overall, I think you did really well, really well articulated and, and it was great. I actually really liked your, your quote at the end from the client. I thought that was really powerful because it showed that, you know, the, a, a really positive outcome and, and, and I guess verbatim and like, um, like Nima said, any kind of stats or quotes or things like that can, can really help tell the story as well. So well done. It was great. Awesome. Thanks, Levy. Thanks, uh, Andy, for, for going through that. Uh, so I will 
move on to Carla's section now. We're going to be going into probably, perhaps, I don't know, maybe this is my own experience with it, but behavioural and situational questions can be some of the most challenging. Um, it, there's, a long, but there's a large range of situational questions that you might be asked. And really the best way to, to get better at answering these questions is to practice and to just be asked many different questions in many different situations, to do a lot of interviews, that sort of stuff always helps. Um, and it comes with experience as well. So um, I'm gonna hand over to Liz and Carla for behavioral and situational questions. Great, hi Carla. Um, hi. So, um, well, naturally, if we were uh, doing this as, as, you know, as a one-on-one -on -one interview, um, some of these questions would probably have come out or even um, come out from uh, probing further, whether, you know, uh, talking through your portfolio or a case study and give you a chance to sort of talk through. Um, and I, I think these are the for, for me, the, the soft skills questions or the behavioural questions are a real chance for everyone to shine because it, it's not just about um, the kind of, you know, specific knowledge that you, you know about UX, um, but that there, you can draw upon experience, you know, sort of experience from non-UX um, sort of roles as well. So, um, and, and as we know, you know, what makes a great UXer is um, someone who not only know, has the, the, the technical skills or, or this knowledge, but also the, the soft skills as well. So um, I tend to really focus a lot about soft skills um, in, in my interview uh, alongside, so not just about the kind of, you know, what it is and, and, the, and the process, but kind of really probe deeper around the, the soft skills elements too. Um, so just for, for, for the, the kind of our webinar today, um, could you just tell me a time when you dealt with a, a really challenging stakeholder? It'd be great if you could sort of just paint the picture for us a little bit around, you know, what was the project, uh, who was the stakeholder and, and, and so on. That's definitely a tough one, Liz. <laughs> um, but obviously there's always tough situations um so look really i'll try and draw on my most recent um experience and and it's thanks to nima has helped me work through better language to use so obviously really excited to be able to um, draw on my ux experience which i got from yourself and um, the other mentors so um in a real life situation it was really exciting and I obviously thought everyone would be on board, but the stakeholder uh, who was the owner of, of the business actually come in and just said, we don't listen to customers here. They don't know anything. So I'd done all this planning. I'd done interviews. I had all this great stuff to deliver. Well, um, the research had all this, these great insights and then I felt really anxious then about, well, how, how do I actually let them know that this is really valid? Um, so what I, what I had the support of a director in the company. So we um, fleshed it out and I actually went into the owner and approached it like a normal conversation. So if he asked me in to talk about another project, I would actually just slip in for when we were both comfortable in that situation oh, by the way, did you know our customers actually liked this about that? Um, if we needed to roll out, um, I helped do, uh, was doing banner designs and helping do EDMs and all there can actually be like heaps of touch points, digital touch points. So um, from the insights from the customer experience surveys I'd done and, and um, from the heat maps and everything, I was able to nicely tell the owner of the business how we could actually improve because we had a couple of websites, his website and the, the main website as well. Um, so I guess that, that was a, it wasn't a direct way of delivering the content, um, but we, we got around it um, through a, a softer method. And was there a situation where um, you had to kind of like maybe if you could draw on another project perhaps um, where you had to really um, 
kind of approach it rather than a softer method, you know, come up with, okay, this, this is, these were the, the tasks or the, the actions that I had to take in order to, to bring the, the stakeholders around. Can you think of another example? Probably timeframes are also tough. Um, a lot of instances, stakeholders want everything done yesterday. Um, and then you actually have to be quite direct and um, actually outline the deliverables and the tasks and how long they take. Mm. Having said that, some are quite um, intense with, no, it actually has to be done. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure. Um, so in that instance, I've just knuckled down got into the work and um, worked the best as I could under that pressure to deliver on the day to the best um, of my ability. And actually when I've delivered um, the work, I've actually said, well, it could have been better in this instance and that instance. Um, but because of the time frame that was left out, I could only um, just say the, a web build, I could only get it to, to this stage. But really it should have been here, here, and here. So um, in that instance, um, if the major stakeholder wants the work done and if they've got the deadline, you meet it and you um, explain to them exactly why it's at the level it is. Um, more often than not, they're actually happy because they just want it. They just want something. So, um, yeah. And so generally when you take, it sounds like you, you, you know, when you take on this sort of pragmatic approach which is just get it done um, and then also explain and being able to uh, play back around what could have been done better if, if, if you had more time or the softer approach what, what are some of the outcomes um, and, and results that you, you would get from, from kind of approaching it in that way? Um, usually people um, are, are quite um, they're okay about it I found 99.9% um, In a do the odd person who just won't tolerate anything, and I guess that is the most difficult situation. Um, and in that instance, I guess I devoid my emotional state and just get along with the job because if you let your emotions get in, then you've lost that battle with that tough stakeholder, client, boss, whoever. So I guess I've learned to um, take the emotion out of my work and just keep heading in the right direction. And, you know, it, these situations, again, hardly ever happen, but when they do, it's, it's pretty tough. And um, it's like, well, I've got to be confident that I can do the job and I've got to let that person know that, I'm doing it and this is as good as you're going to get it. <laughs> and, and maybe go and ask someone else if you don't think I'm good enough. <laughs> I guess that's really coming to um, the crunch. Um, and then just finally, what, what for, for, as a practitioner, what learnings do you draw on from, you know, these sort of situations from dealing with difficult, challenging stakeholders? Oh, look, probably actually how to um, work within a team a whole lot better. Um, how, how do you like to be spoken to? Sometimes it's even just the delivery of how you would like something done in a workplace. Um, it's all in the way you ask in, in your words. So I try and choose my language very aptly and um, show that empathy. Um, and in an agile environment, as you know, um, things get pretty tight, like there's tight schedules, everyone's stressed, you're working with developers, they sometimes run on totally different time schedules and, and, and project managers, like they're not easy. Um, they want their bonus. Um, we want, as a designer, we want to make a beautiful product. Um, yeah, so it's learning how to talk to people in the right way to get the best possible outcome at the end of the day. From And that's day in, day out, really, um, going to work. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Carla. Um, I'll open up to the panel for, for some feedback. Hey guys, I can jump in. So um, it sounds like you've had some difficult stakeholders over your time. <laughs> <laughs> so some really good answers there. Um, I noticed that you detached yourself from, you know, you took the emotion out of it and you kind of, you know, you pointed to the data when you were talking about, um, uh, you know, when you were talking about the, um, 
presenting the results to the, instead of saying I presented the results, you said I presented the data. The customers were saying this, which was really good. It's always good to know. I think you showed a, a lot of um, pragmatism in your answer there and kind of, you know, a, a can do attitude. Like, you know, you, you even the, the situations that you, what you were in were not the best. It was a case of, hey, I'm just going to pull my sleeves up and do it. So that's always something that you're looking for because it can be it can be very difficult um, in a lot of businesses. You know, as you pointed out, there's always time pressures and and budgets and, and things to work towards. So to be able to have that attitude, you know, hey, I can only work within a certain remit and I'll do the best job I can in the restrictions I've got is a really good skill to have. Um, I, I think it's often something you find in um, especially in junior designers, you find that, you know, you quite often get a UXer who wants to come in and change the world and change the entire business. And sometimes that's just, it's just not going to happen. You know, there's not enough resource or there's not enough budget. And sometimes there's not that desire to our understanding. So I think, you know, the ability to kind of go, okay, this is what I've got. This is what I need to do. And, and being able to do it in that, that um, direct way has, has been really good. And um, so I thought, yeah, you were very good. You took the emotion out of it and you looked at it quite objectively. Um, and it also spoke to, you know, how you work in a team and how you work with other people. I thought it was a really positive answer. So, yeah, great stuff. I'll jump in. Thanks, Andrew. I think um, Andrew said a lot of uh, my, my feedback as well. Um, it's interesting that the way you're telling the story, um, knowing that you come from web development, and coming to this, I could feel, I could feel your pain. <laughs> the, the whole world was very different back then. Um, I, I guess one important thing was that, yeah, um, Andrew's right. Like one of the things we're looking for is not one who's not someone who's preaching best practice and who's preaching about changing the world, but it's the best that we can get done at that time with what we have. Um, it's never about the ultimate goal. And a lot of times we see juniors who basically all about preaching and we're going to do this and it's going to be that. And, and it's great, but it shows how green, th how green of a thumb you have. And so the more you talk about, you know, um, your willingness to compromise and trying to at least get a win on the board, um, it, it shows that you're a willing participant and you're not going to be causing friction. I mean, that's one of the things that we're very wary of is that when we hire people, it's, it's hard enough getting design um, in, in the boardrooms and in those levels. So, you know, we, we don't want friction. We want enablement and we want the company to feel empowered by your skill sets, not um, restricted or, or um, confronted by it. So it was a great way of explaining that. And I didn't feel at any point hesitant to go, oh, she's going to cause trouble. So a great way of articulating it. Well done. Awesome. Liz, over to you. Yeah, just um, some just to add to to both Andy's and and Nima's, um, uh, really well done. I think they were they're, they're always some of the toughest questions, <laughs> as Chris alluded to in the interviews, because you can't really, it's not a script. You know, you can't kind of come up with a script for that in a way. Um, it's not like your portfolio or your career experience where you sort of can can um, sort of really prepare for it with these. It just it sometimes depends on the types of questions that they they put in front of you. So um, I think you did that really well in terms of being able to just think on your feet and being able to add, you know draw on your memory and your experience and being able to explain that and and articulate that really well. Um, and and really the way the, the story that you chose as well really helped um, not just sort of to paint. Um, kind of your approach and your techniques to dealing with that difficult stakeholder, but it really um, gave me a sense of your attitude as well, which is, you know, the, the feedback around the pragmatism, the can-do attitude. And that's really important um, in, you know, in terms of the soft skills, that's what a hiring manager is looking for. It's not just about can you, you know, do you have the kind of soft skills of communication and techniques to be able to handle these difficult situations, but what are, what are your own attitudes and mindsets um, towards, um, you know, sort of those things and, and really showing your resilience too. Um, don't underestimate resilience and the need for that in, in you know, the work that we do. So, um, yeah, well done. Thanks, Carla. Awesome. Thanks, Carla. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, just being a part of that, um, for all the three graduates that joined us. We have a bit of time, so um, I wanted to pass on to the Q&A side of things. And if anyone has questions, feel free to submit them now. Uh, we'll just go through them bit by bit over the next period of time. Um, and equally for you, uh, graduates, Mahi and Libby, Carla, feel free to ask your questions as well if you have some follow-ups based on that experience that you went through. Um, this is a great chance to just get some further information if you need it. 
Okay, uh, so I'm just going to jump to the Q&A panel. This was a question that came up earlier today uh, from BiPi. Um, so I'm just going to click that. Um, so BiPi is also a web design freelancer who practices UX product design. Um, I used to be asked how many years of experience um, did they did this person have as a UX product designer? And asking, and wanting to know what is the best way to answer these questions? What do the interviewers want to learn? Um, just quickly, my initial thought with this is one of the bits of context around this question is what is the job requirement of the role that you've applied for? Um, was it a required three to five years experience? Did it require one year experience, etc.? cetera? Um, I would base your answer closely to that if you have obviously um, evidence of experience up to whatever that amount is. So if it's three to five years experience and you've had um, product design experience some UX experience some graphic design experience, you can say that you've had ten, uh, five years of design experience. And then you can go into detail about um, you know, some of the specifics of the type of design work that you did. Um, I wouldn't hesitate if you've got a graphic design background or a web, a traditional web design background, but not necessarily as much UX that um, you would avoid from applying from jobs where you, you need a, a few more years experience. My experience has been that traditional graphic designers, um, a lot of them that I used to work with are now UX UI designers. And when I look at their history profile, it's all UX UI design. But when I worked with them, it was graphic design. I, and I remember seeing it in their, in their job history. So people have changed the terminology um, to accommodate what the market's looking for. So just be aware of that. People tend to pad that out. Uh, so yeah, anything else you guys want to add? Um, I was going to say, uh, sorry, Liz, I think I jumped a little quicker. Sorry, <laughs> it's a clicking wars. Um, I think one of the things you probably want to critically think is if that question is coming up a lot, is it the type of job you're applying for or is it potentially your portfolio that is causing that question to reoccur a lot of times? So there might be a mismatch in expectations or understanding of your skill set um, for the jobs that you're applying for. So if you're applying for a specific type of job and this question keeps coming up, take a step back and go, well, what is my portfolio or what is my CV saying that this question keeps getting raised and asked? Because sometimes you got to understand that this question is coming up because there's a level of confusion that might be there because they're looking at your portfolio and going, I, I don't really know. Like, is it all web design? And it's not your fault. As, as Chris just mentioned, like we've got to go through and sift the shit because the reality is most people lie about how much experience they've got when it comes to junior and mids. Every junior is a mid for some reason, because all of a sudden their illustration skills are now head of product somewhere else. And so we have to be able to ask what the realities are because LinkedIn is not really truthful. It's a bit of a, you know, it's, it's, it's got a bit of a blurry lens to the reality of people's careers. Um, so that's probably why that question is being asked. So don't take it too personal. Um, it, it might be that, you know, they're, they're having to, sift through that because everyone's calling themselves a, a, a mid um, and, and um, your skill set having these skills might not highlight that um, as much as they have by changing their entire history. So you just want to probably articulate that a little bit and say, I have three years of web experience, but in that three years of web experience, two years of it are focused on doing these activities, which are part of the UX kind of spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. I really, um... Yeah, hit the nail on the head there in terms of, of LinkedIn and, and kind of um, what you can sell yourself as. I think, you know, it's a really good trait to, to be open and honest and just talk about the relevant experience you've got. Really, really sell it on, you know, this is what this is what I can do. This is what I've done in the past. I'm, you know, I'm really strong in these areas um, because as well, you know, in the in the instance that you were hired, you know, as a, you know, a more senior level, like it, it doesn't take long to find out once you get into the role. Hey, is this person actually right for the for the job? So uh, it really pays to be to be open and honest. And I think having a you know a positive can do attitude, especially at a junior level, goes a long way. You know, if you're willing to learn and you're willing to to um, put in the put in the work and understand the processes and 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 just you know continuously learn, that's a really good trait to have. 
Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, okay, so on to the next one. This is from Ananda. Uh, so if your interviewer has already read your online portfolio and you have to and you have to give a portfolio presentation, how much detail would you go into for that presentation? Uh, would you go into the level of detail covered in the last presentations that we saw tonight? Or could you cover everything on a more high level, assuming the designer interviewer has already read your website? Uh, I can jump in here. Hi, Ananda. Um, so Ananda was on one of the courses I taught, actually. So nice to see you here. Um, so in terms of, um, as a hiring manager, quite often you're very time poor. Recruitment can sometimes be one of the things that you don't really have time for and you're just doing it on the side. So it's not always, um, you know, you, you don't always have the time that you'd like to have to really go in depth into somebody's portfolio. Quite often, you know, it's a, you're on your lunch break, you'll open, your, you'll open the portfolio, you'll look at the CV, you'll have a scan through, you'll look for some key elements. Uh, it sounds awful, but it's true. Um, so having that dedicated time with the, the candidate is, you know, that's time in your diary where you've actually got the headspace and the time to think and go, actually, now I can really take the time to look at this person's portfolio, understand what they're doing, understand, you know, the rationale behind the decisions, how they work, what they've done. So yeah, absolutely. Um, from my perspective, I would say to give, you know, as much detail as you can um, and, you know, in an open conversation because, yeah, it, the reality is as a hiring manager, quite often you're very time poor when it comes to reviewing candidates' uh, CVs. Great. Anyone, anything else or we're good? Okay. All right. So next question. If you come from another design background, such as architecture, do you think it is relevant to bring the portfolio of, your, of that design background? I'm just going to jump in because the best, best UX researchers I've ever met are architects because they know how to do anthropology. They know how to look at context and deep dive. So 100%. And they're the best hand drawers, hand writers. Like get them writing on walls everywhere you can. Like 100%. Those skill sets are required. And that's what I was saying before, and we've all kind of emphasized is your outside skills will add a lot more value than just having a design cookie cutter kind of um, experience. Like the best, um, literally, I've, I, I've had um, a cartoonist become the best story mappers and user journey designers because they've, they've been able to do it in a way that articulates, uh, exaggerates and emphasizes specific parts of a story. And that's a special skill they have. So um, architecture is actually a, the way I've seen it is a natural kind of progression because the, the architecture industry in Australia sucks. I'll be real. Uh, it's badly paid and it's very uh, egocentric. And so your skill sets are quite ripe for the taking. So I, I've seen people um, just fall in place and do phenomenal um, because th there's a lot of um, similarities in discipline. So I think it's um, don't be afraid to highlight those skill sets. Awesome. Thanks, Nima. Uh, so next question is when answering the soft skills question, uh, so for people who aren't familiar with that term, it's probably the, the behavioral situational type questions. What if you have never experienced that situation? How should you answer? Um, just quickly on that, you likely have, it just may not be in a work context if you're at the beginning of your career. Um, so if you haven't had a manager who you've had a challenging situation with, if that's the type of question you're being asked, maybe it's a relative maybe it's a, a sports coach. These are all not about the con content or the, the environment that it was in. It was about how you responded to it. And that's the same if it's a work context or not. Liz? Yeah, I thought I might just um, add to that. Agreed, Chris. I think um, usually those behavioural questions, it's something, it's, it's generally draws upon our human experience. So, uh, so not just sort of work context. So draw, draw upon that. Um, I've as a hiring manager, I, I would appreciate the honesty. Like you could say, look, I've not experienced this in a work context, but here's an example of how I'm, you know, I've, it's, I've, I've, it's happened to me and, and kind of draw on that. Or the other, the other way, after sort of being honest that you've not experienced it before, um, sort of imagine if, you know, if you have sort of, uh, if you have been in that situation. So the, usually the hiring manager, I, I could, potentially um, reposition the question so that, you know, if you were coming across a very challenging cust um, stakeholder and they were, and then, you know, I might sort of explain a bit more about what the context might be, how would you deal with that? Then 
that means you 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 know there, there you should be able to just answer that in all honesty around how you would approach that that situation as well. Great, thank you. Okay, next question: What are some of the good example questions to understand the design maturity of the company that I'm interviewing for? That's from Bora. I I generally um, going into um, a job, ask them what success looks like in my role and what the success looks like in, a, in the projects that they're considering. Because that shows their maturity of, oh, I just need a website done or I just need to look pretty. You can understand that. And the other part, that's natural question is feeding their back at them and go, what methodologies do you use that you're comfortable with that I could you know, start looking at and aligning myself with? So throwing it back on them and saying, well, what do you use? I know this methodology and this framework um, which are the frameworks that you prefer and, and why? Um, and that helps both of you try and relate on that, um, I guess, theoretical manner. Great, thanks, Nima. Uh, okay, so this is for perhaps the second stage of an interview process. Um, do you have any tips for preparing for the next stage, i.e. a design challenge? Um, I don't mind jumping in here. So that's the design challenge can always be a tricky one because obviously you don't know what's coming. But I think as a as a hiring manager who sets a design challenge, um, you're you're essentially looking for certain um, skills in the candidate. So you're looking to see really for for me when I set a design challenge, it's under it's all about understanding how the candidate approaches the problem and then goes about solving it. So it's kind of similar to that process. Um, sometimes, you know, if it's a design challenge and you've got half an hour or, you know, 20 minutes to do it, it's more about saying, hey, so this is the problem and here's, here's how I'd go about solve it, solving it. You know, half an hour is not a realistic or fair amount of time to solve a problem. It's more about uh, outlining the steps that you'd take to do it um, and documenting those. Um, if you had longer to do it, if it was a few, you know, you'd been given a, a week's notice, then it may be a case of, of going into a bit more detail and actually doing some of your design process. And, and I guess structuring it into a, a mini a mini presentation, like a, a stakeholder walkthrough, where you can you know walk through your um, customer problem, business problem, research, uh, designs, iterations, and results. So that's that's where I'd um, add to that. Anyone else? Um, okay. All right. So next question is from Reshma. How do we showcase project results in our portfolio for which we have not been able to get the final ROI or feedback from the customer? Good question. Anyone want to have a go at that? Um, well, I might. I might just sort of um, add what comes to mind there. Um, I, I, what I would do is at least put together some um, learnings around what you've learned through that portfolio, um, through through that project, because to me, that's that's a type of result or outcome for working on that project. Um, that's really important in uh, you know being able to to see from it from a candidate for, from a candidate. So um, yeah, don't be scared about um, including some projects where you might not have got the you know what, what the final outcome or the final feedback um, and obviously we're all hoping for really positive outcomes and feedback um, it, it's better to just be honest around sort of you know what are some of the learnings um, and also if it is if it hasn't been a great feedback um, actually be honest and include that and potentially then showing well how would you improve on that on that feedback as well so um, yeah, great. Thanks, Liz. Nima, go I ahead. think I think that's one of the hardest things in a portfolio, even up until the level you're a senior is showing the value of your work because it's one thing to design it or to come uh, discover it and ideate and put it together. It's another that it's implemented. And there's a couple of restrictions. The higher you go up, you've got NDAs where I've got stuff in my portfolio that's five years old. I still can't show it. Like the results are hidden. And so you're naturally going to get those things. But if you can at least show what was the internal feedback? What was the changes? What did the client like? And how did they change? Did, they, did it open up their eyes? Because as a project, you're, you're, it's a duality. You're, you're maturing the company and helping educate the customer. And you're also designing a better product or service for the customer. So any side of those um, is useful. 
And if there is none, you can actually say, you know, I'm still waiting or I'm still acquiring to look at what those results may be. But you've done user testing. You've done some usability testing. That's still a result. So make sure that that's at least there. You know, you've tested it with six people and, you know, 50 percent, three people love this about that product and thought that it was quite useful. That's still great feedback. Awesome. Yeah. And, and hiring managers will understand um, that you don't have all the results. Uh, particularly if they're at a mid to quite senior and maturity company in terms of UX, they understand that there are so many barriers to projects going live that have nothing to do with the UX part. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be the end of the world if you can't show it. Uh, Bye asks another question. I just finished a design review interview. I wonder if the design review interview is the same as the app critique design interview. Is there any difference between review and critique and what's the interviewer wanting to learn from it? Okay, so I think it's a semantics one, but anyone want to grab that? At first glance, I don't think there's any difference um, unless anyone disagrees. Generally, it's the same thing. So depending who you speak to, who the who the job is for, they might describe it slightly differently if you see it in in a, you know, an email exchange or communication. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's go ahead, Dima. Yeah, I was just going to say it might be semantics, but sometimes a critique is an opinion based on you know the the, the reviewer looking at it, whereas a, a review could be the outcome, reviewing the outcome rather than the design. So sometimes you're critiquing a design or a product, um, but a reviewing a design or product is also related to some of the processes and stuff like that. So sometimes those little um, changes in words have different meanings, but generally in your process, it should be that it's a review. It's looking at the end to end. Um, kind of approach of how you, what the brief was, what you did, and what you, you know, what what you put out there, and what the you know, results were. Great, thank you. Uh, so next question: If if someone wanted to get into a UX career but they haven't done any design jobs for six years, how would you recommend going about using other experience as a positive in the interview? For example, if someone took six years to travel around the world as an English teacher, I am jealous. <laughs> then, um, yeah, what? How do they position themselves? I can jump in here. So, look, um, you can always draw on your experiences. You know, your softer skills, um, your problem solving, and uh, and just general articulation. But I guess if you're, you know, if your portfolio hasn't seen any any action for six years, it might be a good idea just to do a few personal projects, you know, look for things that interest you or, you know, imagine technologies or, you know, set yourself a design challenge and, and, and just work through the process. And then you've at least, you know, starting to build some, some more modern um, work that you can then talk about and kind of, you know, explain your process and understand. I think it's really important to have something to hang your, um, you know, to hang your skills off and to show that you're able to work through the process. And six years, you know, six years in UX is a long time. There's lots of new processes, tools, um, methodologies, thinking that comes around in that time. So I think it's, you know, very advisable to um, to freshen up your portfolio with a few personal projects um, and, and I guess take it from there and obviously, you know, look for, look for work that interests you that you can uh, apply any other relevant experience to that you may have from, you know, the career other career paths that you've been down. Great, thanks, thanks, Andy. Okay, um, I'm going to just hand over to Mahin who has a question. So feel free to go, go, Mahin. Uh, thanks, Prish. Um, I have one question. Uh, beyond a great portfolio and technical skill, what advice would you give me uh, about how to best prepare for an inter job interview? Who would like to take that? I can give a few initial thoughts if you like, Mahin. Um, so firstly, uh, practice makes perfect for specific type of questions that you know you're gonna be asked. So this whole webinar tonight was about some very common themes that tend to come up. So get someone who's in your family or friends to formulate a few different ways of asking very similar type of questions so that you can tackle them one over and over again. It's, you know, we tell all of our students when they're about to present to a client, present in front of the mirror, do it and get, make it become a muscle response rather than a thought process because a thought process is always jarred. It's never as fluid. It's never as, um, 
as engaging. So the, the more it can become a muscle response and you're feeling confident and relaxed, the better. So practice makes perfect for sure. Um, aside from the other general things around presentable, be on time, um, have, a, have some portfolio work if you are going in face to face, but it's just some visuals if you need it. Um, and yeah, obviously understand who you're meeting, what their roles are, um, and do a bit of background research, know the company, uh, know them, know what they do and why you can help what they do and why you'd be an asset for them. These are things that might be tweaked for every different types of interview that you go to. If you go in with the same response for every company, it will come across that you haven't really considered their needs. They want to be your only client in the sense of who you're seeking a job from. I know it's not the case, but if you can make that come, if that comes across, it's, it's going to make you, it's going to put you in good stead. So over to you guys. And there's one little psychological tip. The number one thing that you can do to make anyone lower their defenses and relate to you is ask for advice. Even if they know that's your intent, it's been proven um, psychologically that asking for advice lowers both level, both people to have a very um, transparent and very humble experience between um, two parties. So if you, if you ask for feedback, even at the end of it, that is very helpful because it only makes your next interview, if you have to go to a next interview, even better. Um, and, the, and the other part is, never, ever, ever sound like you're repeating the same thing in your head a hundred times. Make sure it sounds energetic, exciting, and just yourself. Because if you don't shine through, then you're probably going to look like the rest of them that are cookie cutters. I always call them cookie cutters because they've, they say the same thing over and over again because they've gone to like 10 interviews. They sent, they, they're kind of just like robotically answering it. They're not actually listening. So when you ask the question, they go to what they thought you said rather than what you actually asked. And so just be present. That is very helpful. And, and your personality as a junior is your attitude, your soft skills, your personality, and your ability to understand theoretically what needs to be done are the things that we're looking for we're not looking for the output at the end that that can be mastered and you know we can help mold that but it's it's that attitude you can't change someone's attitude if they come in thinking they're, they're the best ux designer that's uh, that's that's been around but they've been you know, you know they're only 19 years old they've never had anything they don't have anything in their portfolio then you're going to go well i'm not going to my guard is up i'm not going to really take what you have to say as as deep as i should because you've already put yourself in that in that attack position so be natural and just um, to tell that story because that's the one thing that designers are really good at is, you know, we, we want to, we, we're trying to get everyone to empathize with the customer. And, and, and so make sure that you let the person that's interviewing you empathize with you. Yeah. And I can't, um, you know, underestimate the value of just a positive attitude and being personable. Like as a junior, we know that you've got a lot to learn and chances are, you know, you learn lots in every company you go to anyway, there's new processes, new, new stakeholders. So we know there's a lot to learn. Um, and the more you can show is that, you know, you're up for the challenge and you're willing to learn and you just, you know, you, you want to push forward uh, is going to work in your favor. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, as a hiring manager, you're going to be working with this person. You're going to be having one-on-ones with them. You want somebody that's going to be easy to work with and easy to get on with. And that does play, that does play you know, a big part in your decision-making as well. We have, a, um, a, I guess, I have a policy, which is, you know, no big egos in the team, because that can often be disruptive as well. So like I think Nima said, you know, if some, someone comes in claiming the, the best designer since Steve Jobs, um, you know, and they're only 19 and they've got no experience, like that's not. Thank you. What a Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Uh, next question is from Mimi. What are some good questions you would recommend asking the interviewers at the end of the interview? Yeah, I might, I might take this one. Um, it's, a, it's a really good question to me. The types of questions that a candidate asks at the end of the interview is as telling <laughs> about, about them as a candidate as the, you know, the, their answers to the questions that, that a hiring manager would ask. Um, so um, sort of echoing what Nima had said earlier as well, um, I really like it when um, candidates ask like, you know, what are some of the, 
what does success look like for this role? What are your expectations um, of, of me if I was to, you know, to take on this role? And um, also the challenges as well, because I, I think you'd want someone who um, is able, who wants to come in knowing the full picture of the whole organisation, not just sort of, you know, what can the organisation do for, for me, uh, but also what can, what value can I do for the organisation and understanding the, val the, the successes and the challenges would, would tell me that that what is the, the person's motivation behind that. Okay, thanks Liz. Um, I think also Nima mentioned something earlier to another question was just about um, asking about the company's design processes and you know what they actually do um, in their team. How, what's the day-to-day -day look like? Um, getting that information shows you're curious you know, it shows that you're interested in um, figuring out how you would fit in. You know, that sort of stuff can help establish some confidence in the hiring manager. Okay, next question is from Valeria. What about when you have a different professional background that is not directly related to UX? Uh, so we've sort of touched on this, but we'll keep going. What sort of questions do we need to be ready for that allows you to interview to check the candidate has certain soft skills required for the position? So I guess there's two parts there. It's um, you know, what if you don't have um, a background that's directly related to UX? So we might start with that one. I don't mind jumping in here. So I think in terms of having a, you know, a background that's not directly related to UX, um, there's always a lot, you know, a lot of other careers and a lot of paths have crossover, especially around the soft skills, you know, um, it's how you articulate, how, how you articulate your ideas or concepts. It's, um, you know, how you deal with difficult stakeholders. Those are things that come up in every job. It's not necessarily uh, UX related, um, you know, how you present yourself and how you, are, how confident you are with, with presentations. Like, is there any, any, um, anything you can draw on where you've had to, to talk to stakeholders about a, a subject or a topic. Uh, maybe there's things that you do in, you know, outside of work if in, a, in a hobby capacity or, a, you know, extracurricular that would also have, um, you know, crossover. So I guess it's looking at the, um, the role that you're going for and really just kind of saying, well, you know, what are things that are common across not just a design job, but across a lot of things. And you'll really often find it's around the soft skills and the, um, you know, dealing with dealing with different situations, working as part of a team, um, you know, being compatible with the people. Great, thanks, Andy. Yeah, the second part to that question um, was just about what type of questions can we expect, um, and what do we need to be ready for um, when a, an interviewer is is probing soft skills and. I, this relates to that last segment of the webinar where we asked Carla some questions on how she'd handle difficult situations. Um, other types of questions, the classic one is, tell me one of your weaknesses. Um, you know, how do you respond to that? How do you um, sort of show a, an ability of self-reflection and also your ability to communicate effectively? Self-reflection is a big one. Um, for me personally, when I'm hiring, I'm looking for someone who is able to see themselves outside of their own biases as much as possible because it allows them to then grow at a faster rate than someone else who can't. If someone isn't able to see their own um, areas for development, it becomes more challenging to develop that person as an individual staff member. And so particularly for a junior role, if you come in with that open mind and that um, ability to self-reflect and you can demonstrate that in answers to these questions that can be uh, really helpful and that's why sometimes it's okay to speak about your weaknesses it's okay to speak about um, your s things that you know that you're working on you know we're not all perfect we're all works in progress and so um, keeping that in mind when you're in the interview that authenticity will help you will help establish confidence again with the hiring manager and please don't say your your weakness is perfectionist being a perfectionist that's so overrated please come up with something new <laughs> yeah there's lots on google if you need to need to jog your, your mind of how to answer it but then eventually you need to bring it back to something that's really authentic for you okay uh, next question is uh do you think a science degree could be leveraged as a strength I'll jump in here. Um, absolutely. I think, you know, in a science degree, there we, you would have a lot of experience in research, 
you'd be very methodical. You would understand a lot about, um, I guess, how to structure a project and, 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 you know, have a process in itself in like a design process. So I think absolutely um, a science degree could definitely be leveraged as a strength. What I would be interested in as part of that is, you know, how you perform your research and how, you know, your methodology and, and methods. Um, in all honesty, I think someone with a science degree could probably teach um, some UX people a lot about research and how to set research up properly, because I feel like science is much more of a, um, I guess, a defined approach because it is, I guess, part of science is researching. Whereas I think to a lot of UXs, uh, research is just something that falls into their remit when they when they get into it. Maybe they started as UI designer and they've started doing research. So I absolutely think that's a, a, a great strength that could be leveraged for sure. Great, thanks. Oh, oh my God, we learned off you. So we're trying to apply your practice into like product and services. So science and its uh, methodology is is more proven than our even approach. Our approach is thirty years old. Science is thousands of years old. So if anything, you could you could say that your rigor and your candor is probably far more refined than even myself. So it's a great it's a great skill set. And don't forget that you know with the with the science background, UX is one path, but it's so is data scientists. They have a great, great rigor as well and great methodology as well. So having that background, um, you're probably going to be looked at with someone who's very process driven and methodical. So there are some specific roles even within the UX spectrum and product spectrum that you would you would probably fit in quite um, well. Awesome. Thanks, Dima. And it's it's quite common for UX designers to come from so many different backgrounds. It's one of those new modern skills like product managers, like UX designers. <laughs> where no, no two UX designers have the same background. It's, it's really incredible. So um, absolutely, it can be a strength. Uh, Andrea asks, how many possibilities can realistically someone have to get a junior position with six months of experience, a big gap, and zigzag choices in their career history? Do multi multidisciplinary skills pay off in any case? Uh, what soft and hard skills are the best to show in this case? Okay, so that's three questions. But the first one I think uh, we'll start with is, yeah, what do you do if you've got a big gap in your career history and if you've had maybe a lot of different types of roles um, and you're looking for a junior position? Um, I might start us off on this one. I think for me, um, that's where having a portfolio to supplement um, with your resume is, is going to set you up for um, greater success than just, you know, sending through a, a resume um, with sort of like the, the gaps and the, the choice, the various sort of large choices that they've had in their career history. Because um, I, as you say, Chris, you know, having someone, uh, a well-rounded UXer actually um, having come from different backgrounds is really super useful. But I'd want, as a hiring manager, I'd want to know that they have at least the foundational aspects of what the process and the methodology is. Um, so the, the portfolio will showcase that um, for, for, for me. So, um, yeah, I, I would tackle that by, by making sure that there, there is a good couple of case studies um, or, you know, a portfolio that sort of really showcase my process um, in, in that instance. And just one thing, we don't expect history. You're a junior. We don't expect you to come from 20 years of experience. You could have nothing. That's the whole point of a role in a junior. So um, don't expect everyone, don't, don't have that pressure on yourself that you've got to have this in, like long history of being like of, of design and UX and product and web development. You don't need that. As a junior, the, the gates are open. You're coming in fresh. So that's that's what we expect. So don't think we expect a lot from you from from an experience perspective. Well, uh, uh, what um, uh, Liz said, like we we want um, you that we want to know that you have the fundamentals. That's really it, um, and that you have a great attitude. Um, the, the rest is just nice to have. So just take the pressure off and and just go in with a smile. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nima. Thanks, Liz. Uh, okay, so next question is from Eva. Uh, Hello, panelists. I plan to career transition into UX design, bringing with me tons of transferable soft skills, but close to zero relevant UX experience. Should I acquire some formal learning training qualification before applying for any UX junior UX roles or apply anyway and see what kind of feedback I receive from the hiring managers?
I'm biased, so I can't answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so, look, zero relevant UX experience. You might be surprised what may be relevant. So, although you may think, you know, I've got no relevant UX experience, maybe, maybe there are things you could draw on. Um, I think we mentioned it before, but it's similar to kind of of having a, having a large gap, like it's always a, a great starting point is to have a portfolio to hang things off. And there's lots of ways that you can help, you can start to build a portfolio. You know, there are um, Plug for Harness, there's some great, you know, training companies that will, you know, offer you um, experience on a live project, or you could set yourself a design challenge. You know, there's tons of, um, you know, you know, Dribble and Behance, there's tons of challenges that people set on there that you can that you can start to get into and dabble. But I think the, the big thing is just to start, um, to start off by making yourself a portfolio, learning the process and, and trying it out and experimenting and, and you know, getting a body of work that you can then talk to and say, hey, so uh, I'm applying for this UX job and I feel like I'm, you know, I've got the required skill set because you know, this is my work and this is my process and these are the steps I take and this is how I solve problems and um, you know, showing that passion for it. Um, I think it would be difficult without any kind of uh, portfolio or any kind of work to show to, to get into the interview space. Um, but as soon as you can start building building that up and getting experience, um, the, the you know the sooner you'll be able to 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 step into that. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, and I think we you have to remember that you're out there in a marketplace of other people also seeking the same role. So there is going to be that comparison point of you know what how do I when I view your um, presentation of your UX ability and experience versus the next person. How do I make my determination? So that's why portfolios are so critical in the design space. Um, they really help to get underneath um, the surface of your ability. Um, and the one minute plug without going into too much detail is that's effectively how we, why we designed harness projects is to help people like yourself have access to training, but also to get experience at the same time. So, um, you know, we deliver project based learning where you're doing a project while you're learning. And that's meant to help bridge that gap for the for those of you who are looking for avenues to build a portfolio and experience as well as that fundamental training. So um, that's the last plug for the night. <laughs> and I think like the process, let's not underestimate the process. So you send your CV that generally that's what's going to happen. You're, we don't expect much experience from you. So we're going to look at your portfolio to see, do you understand the fundamentals to come through to the next round? And we interview you and we get to know you. We might give you a challenge to make sure we test the fundamentals and then we go from there. So um, your CV is trying to give us context of who you are and what your background is. And your portfolio is giving us an understanding of if you know the base understanding of, of the processes involved um, as, as Liz and Andy have um, um, expressed. So um, don't worry about your CV and your previous history. And I think there's a lot of questions about that. That's not what we're looking for. It's what we're looking, when we look at a CV, it's context. We look at the portfolio for process. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, what have we got? We've got about got a handful left. Um, are you guys okay if we just go 10, 10 minutes over or so? Okay. Uh, so next question, in the job description, uh, they ask about Adobe XD or Figma. Do you prefer people who do have them or are willing to learn? Um, so I'm assuming that question just around tool choice and what, you've, what ability you have. I don't mind jumping in here. Um, and it, it, look, it may differ with companies, but my, myself, my personal um, view on that is that all of the, there's so many, there's so many tools out there um, and new tools are popping up all the time. Like part of, part of being a UX designer is, you know, always learning new tools and continuing. So personally, I, I don't think it's an issue if you, if, the tool that the company uses isn't your tool of choice because you know quite a lot of them are very similar it's more about you know understanding the process and the design principles the tool is something that you can learn it's just something that you're going to use to you know to execute your design process so really it's the fundamentals that are the, the more important thing rather than the tools but I, I understand as well how it's can be daunting um, as a junior or someone looking for work when I was many moons ago a print designer um, I was I knew a, Adobe in design and, and would never apply for a job that required Quark, Quark Express, because I was like, I'm never going to get it. It's, they need Quark. But if I'd have known that now, 
uh, you know, it's just a tool. It's it's just a way of executing your work. Yeah, especially for a junior role, don't be put off by the tool. Um, every company has a different tool. There are some market leading ones. Start with those, and then they're pretty. It's pretty straightforward to make the transition over over a little bit of time. Okay. Uh, uh, oops, I think I closed one by accident. Sorry if I missed one. Uh, Leah says, thank you, panelists. I was wondering, how do you answer questions about pay expectations, especially when transitioning from a different field where you may might have been at a higher earning threshold and now going for a junior role? It's a good question. I'm a bit passionate about this. I hate jobs who don't have a job, uh, a, a, a kind of a salary posted on the job because it kind of puts wrong expectations on both sides and it becomes awkward. So I think the more transparent we are as managers to put that expect salary expectation, the better it is for everyone. Um, but generally speaking, um, we know that it's going to be a natural sacrifice. We're not going to, you're not going to get a doctrine um, kind of salary for a junior UX role, but you can use things like Glassdoor and um, some other services where you can look at what comparatively the price range is for a junior and, and, and know your expectations going in that role. You, you're willing to make that sacrifice to get into a field that you're passionate about. Awesome, thanks Nina. Uh, so next is what are some of the most memorable questions candidates have thrown back at you at the end of an interview? So we've touched on this a bit, but does anything come to mind, guys? Oh, I think that I had one recently. I'm just trying to remember it. I remember it caught me off guard. <laughs> One of them I got was, why would I fit in this role? And I was like, oh, okay, snap. <laughs> I'm throwing it back on me. Now I've got to think about why you fit in this role. <laughs> but it, it was, I mean, you normally think about it. It was quite witty though. So I found that kind of fun that it was like throwing it back and going, why do you want me here? And it was in a nice way. It wasn't being egotistical, but I thought that was a bit fun. But I don't want every job I look for, like every job description or interview I come with coming with that line, please. <laughs> Yeah, on, on a similar vein, I had a question that was, um, how did I do? <laughs> and, uh, and so actually, it was the first time I ever had that specific question come to me in the middle of the interview. I was like, now, what was important about the question was that this was not a UX role that I was recruiting for. It was a sales role. And um, one of the aspects of being a strong salesperson is being able to ask for the sale, to being able to be, have the confidence to um, ask the hard questions. And so it was a little bit of a demonstration of that. So in that context, it, it was, it was well received. Um, and you typically are not going to get an answer that is either here nor there at, in the moment, generally, unless the hiring manager is really caught off guard, but my response was quite neutral. And so it doesn't give them any sense of what my decision is, because to be honest, I, usually we haven't made a decision straight away. We need a bit of time to speak to other people, reflect on, on the session, interview other candidates before a decision is made. So um, don't expect that question to get you a, a sort of yes, no. Okay, so next question is, should you include discuss a project, part of the project in the portfolio that failed completely, but you learn from it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a uh, failure is a part of any product development process of any agile process of any UX design process, you'll never get it perfect in the first go. Um, what you took from the failure is where your behavioral qualities come through, right? We talked about this before. Um, how ca can you take on a situation that is deemed failure and turn it into a into a growth opportunity? Uh, so Arun asks, design review might be about reviewing your designs. App oh, is this just a comment? App critique design review about some popular app. Your thoughts on its design? I'm not entirely sure. Is anyone super clear on what's being asked there? Okay, we might skip over that, Arun. Uh, I think to... it's more about um, someone might say, can you, what are your um, critique about the new TikTok app? Uh -huh. What can be improved, blah, 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 which is a critique. Um, versus a review, which is more about the process of how you did it. I think that's what the comment yeah, is so referring to. My apologies. Uh, so yeah, any any other thoughts on on that topic? Okay. I guess I can maybe jump in and just I guess related. It's 
to be asked to critique an app, hey, what do you think of this app? What, how, how would you make it better? I think something that um, you know hiring managers are looking for is not, oh, I'd change the font, I'd update the colors, I'd, I'd redo the branding. It's more about, I'd look for data, I'd interview people, I'd find out you know what people are, where, where the customer problems are with the app, where the pain points for people are, and I would use that data to improve on those. So I guess, you know, if you've been asked to critique an app, it's the, the, kind of the hiring manager is most likely looking for your approach to solving the problem. And they're probably looking for you to talk about data and gathering insights. Great. It's kind of a trap question, actually, because you can get called out by having an opinion over doing the process. It's a natural way of saying, oh, I think it sucks and you can fix this. But you're right. It's a good, good, good call. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Great point to always fall back on your UX process for those questions. Uh, now, the next question is, how honest would you should you be about your weaknesses? If you're less strong in some areas in UX, UI, would you call that out and say what you're doing to grow in these areas? Yeah, I might kick us off on that one. Um, for me, as a hiring manager, it's uh, it's so important if um, the candidate is super honest, um, and obviously not to a point where you're positioning yourself so that you're not, you know, you don't know anything about it. Um, so I think um, showing that where you're honest about your own weaknesses, it sort of reflects on what you were saying, Chris, that that, that ability to self-reflect um, and have some self-awareness and that kind of emotional intelligence to be able to call out um, where your areas of growth are and even better to be able to then also um, show, uh, you know, some of the things that you are doing in those areas too. So um, it, it sort of shows that maturity too. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. Uh, next question, just a couple left. Uh, is it possible to apply for a UX position without a portfolio when you come from a design background or would that be a very unfavorable approach? Unfavorable? <laughs> I, I would say you probably want to get promoted internally because if you don't have a lot of work to show off, it's going to kind of come back with, you, you can theoretically say stuff, but what do you refer back to? It's very hard as a, as a manager to look back at your work and understand that you were able to apply your learnings rather than just regurgitating what you've seen on YouTube or in an interview, et cetera. Yeah. It, it just, yeah. sorry, Andy, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to jump in there as well. And uh, like just going to the process of when you're in, as a manager, you're hiring. Like the, the first thing you look for is the CV and the portfolio. Like I've, we've had candidates that didn't share a portfolio and it was kind of end of the line because you, you've got no idea of what they're processing, what they're capable of other than the words on the, the CV. So for, for me, and I think for, um, you know, a lot of um, uh, colleagues that I've worked with, it's a really important part of, of the interview. That said, I have seen, um, I have seen, portfolios from you know from more researchers that are not ui heavy or graphically heavy and that's fine as long as you've got a case study and and things to talk about that again just go back to that process and outline your steps of how you do things that's fine so it doesn't have to be you know if you're not if you're not strong in ui it doesn't have to be that way minded it just has to detail your process and, and what you're about and what you do awesome. thanks Andy. Uh, last question how many projects for a portfolio Simple one. Minimum three. <laughs> Minimum. Yeah, and I would I would say, I guess you don't want. I, I would say just put the ones that are high quality in there that really you know that really um, explain your process and the ones that you're really proud of and the ones that have, I guess you know if you have got a lot of projects maybe tailor those to the role that you're going for. You know, if you've got ones that, are, that, that you think are more relevant for the particular job you're going for, um, adapt your portfolio to show those ones. Um, I guess, again, going back to the process of hiring, like you probably, as a, as a hiring manager, not going to get past the first four or five anyway. Um, when you're scrolling through, you'll, you'll take a look at the first three and you'll be like, yep, yeah, this is cool, let's get them in. So um, I, I think, yeah, um, less is more sometimes as well. So minimum three. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Well, that's all the questions for tonight. Um, I just want to say another big thank you to our panel, Andy, Liz, Nima, and to our grads, Mahin, Carla, Levy. Uh, 
awesome, awesome effort, courageous effort to be interviewed in front of all these people. <laughs> we hope it's been valuable for you all. Um, we will be posting a recording on our YouTube channel early next week and we will email out the link. So you'll be able to look back on it, um, take down any notes that um, you might need to for your interviews and best of luck to everyone. We hope you land the job of your dreams and um, that this has helped you in some way prepare for those interviews. Um, if you want to get in touch with us at Harness Projects, hit our website at harnessprojects.com.au. Uh, you can also book a call with me if you want to discuss our upcoming UX courses. We have some uh, courses commencing in April. Our February intake has filled up, but we have April intakes starting um, around the first week of April. So feel free to get in touch. Happy to have a chat and just talk about UX stuff with you. Um, it's been fun. Uh, thanks for staying a bit later, everyone as well. And uh, we will see you to at the next one.